Good morning and welcome to worship on this third Sunday of Easter. It is good to be gathered again together for worship. And um, so good morning to you all. Um, we are um, going to proceed as we always do together following along with the worship materials provided to you uh, earlier in the week. And so, please um, join me then in the uh, confession and forgiveness. Sorry, there was a phone playing our worship service in the background. We're okay now. Didn't mean to get distracted. <laughs> All right. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the fountain of living water, the rock who gave us birth, our light, and our salvation. Amen. Let us come into the light, the revealing and healing light of God. God of grace and glory, you have brought us through the night of sin into the light of Jesus' resurrection. Yet our lives are still shadowed by sin. Make us alive in Christ, O God. Make us new as you make all things new. Rescue us from evil and sin. Renew us in grace and restore us to living in your holiness. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Rejoice with all creation around God's throne. The light of the risen Christ puts to flight all evil deeds, washes away sin, restores innocence to the fallen, casts out hate, brings peace, and humbles earthly pride. Jesus Christ loves you and frees you from your sins by his blood. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Our first hymn is Day of Arising. Uh, the scripture is um, very much so a part of this hymn, the gospel we're going to hear today, the walk on the road to Emmaus. Um, and so pay attention to the words, even if you aren't singing along, uh, meditate on the story that the hymn is telling. It's a short hymn. We are going to sing all four verses.
join together in the prayer of the day. Let us pray. O oh God, your Son makes himself known to all his disciples in the breaking of the bread. Open the eyes of our faith that we may see him in his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from Acts chapter 2, verse 14, and verse 36 to 41. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, and everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And Peter testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who, are welcomed, who welcomed Jesus' message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now our second reading is from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 17 to 23. If you invoke as father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. Know that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew not of perishable, but of imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 24th, chap 24th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And Jesus said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? Jesus asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and beside all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find Jesus' body there, they came back 
and told us that he had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared! Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But the two urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening. The day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? Now that same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed. He has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the road and how Jesus had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the gospel of the Lord. Christ is risen. Alleluia. Much like last week, we find ourselves in real time, here and now, weeks away from Easter Sunday away in time from the women's discovery of the empty tomb. But in our scripture, like last week, we find the gospel story to be taking place on that same day, on the first Easter day. Now we are not in the upper room in the evening with the 10 disciples, that group closest to Jesus. No, this time we are on the road from Jerusalem to a town called Emmaus. We're traveling in the afternoon with two other followers of Jesus, one named Cleopas and his companion. These two men are unknown to us from other stories of Jesus' followers, but it's clear from their emotion that they were more than just those who listened to him once as he passed through a town. They were on the inside enough to have heard the story of the empty tomb and to connect it to the things Jesus said about being raised on the third day. Jesus had been a focus of their hope for the redemption of Israel, and they had witnessed his death. This wasn't a passing interest in the rabbi of the day. They had been invested in Jesus and what they thought he was meant to do. Their world and everything they had come to hope in most had now come to a drastic halt. They were witnesses to Jesus' ministry, to his teaching, and now to his death. And they were grieving not just the loss of Jesus, but everything that they had believed about him. Now, it doesn't seem that they completely discount the empty tomb, but it does seem that with no sign of Jesus, they realize it's time to go home to return to whatever life now would hold for them in these days to come. As they walked this road that no doubt they've traveled many times before, they're deeply into their rehashing of events as they discuss all that has happened. And so perhaps they don't even really notice when along comes a stranger who is curious about their discussion as they walk along. Maybe this stranger has something to add to the conversation. Maybe he was also a follower of Jesus, feeling the same as they were. Maybe as they walk, they could provide companionship and support to one another, listen to each other's stories. 
Well, they are in utter shock to hear that this man doesn't even know all that has taken place in Jerusalem in these days. I mean, what rock has he been hiding under? How can he not know? So they explain to him all that has taken place, who Jesus was, a prophet, mighty indeed, how he died, and why it all mattered. It's almost as if they were reciting the creed. And the stranger, who we know is Jesus, but they don't know is Jesus, calls them foolish, calls them slow of heart to believe. It feels a little harsh. They seem faithful enough. They're wrestling with what seems to be an ever-changing story. They're trying to figure it out together. It's only to be expected that they feel a little lost, sad, less, less hopeful about what's to come next. But then, in the stranger, who is really Jesus' defense, well, maybe his response is only a fair reply. And after all, they just asked him how he couldn't possibly know what had been going on these past days. So maybe he pops back with a little snark of his own. This is a discussion, walking along the road. Now, Cleopas has backed up their question of him not knowing all that's taken place by telling him all that he didn't know about the events. Well, now the stranger does the same thing. He backs up his statement that they're slow to believe all that the prophets have said by taking them back to Moses to show them how the saving work of God has been part of Israel's story. Well, really, part of their story. The stranger's interpretation of the ancient stories of their redeeming God warms their hearts. Imagine if we were to come across someone who didn't know the story of recent events related to COVID-19 as we we're walking in our masks six feet apart through the park. What would we say to explain it to them, only to have the tables turned back, to have that stranger help us to see God at work in the world? Now I have to wonder about how it is that they didn't recognize Jesus. And that scripture tells us that the two men's eyes were kept from recognizing him. But kept how? Could they just not see because of all that had happened? Because that stranger just couldn't possibly be Jesus? Or was Jesus hiding from them, holding back to make a more dramatic reveal later in the story? I suppose I'd like to blame it on Jesus to say he was disguising himself somehow. But it doesn't feel right, does it? That he would walk along with them, seeing their great sadness, hearing them witness to him about his own life and death, hearing them say they had hoped. I can't believe that Jesus would purposely hold back. He was there. He was with them. He wasn't hiding himself. But then at the same time, I don't want to come down too hard on Cleopas and his buddy. Because if there was anyone that they would have wanted to see walking with them in that moment, they would have wanted to see Jesus. They weren't keeping their own eyes from seeing him. They wanted to see him. But sometimes that's just how it is. We hope to see Jesus. We want to recognize him everywhere we go, to know he's walking right alongside us. In those days, sometimes it can be the hardest to find him. The story reminds us that Jesus is present, is walking with us, is talking with us as even a stranger. And we will some days miss it completely at the time There will be those hard days. Days when we say we had hoped. We have to walk through those days. We have to travel through them. 
Just because Jesus is our Savior, it doesn't mean we get an easy pass, a quick fix. And maybe you're tired of hearing that about now. When these hard days that we're in don't seem to offer up any relief. Come on, Jesus, don't make us work so hard to see you. Let's just hold on to that for a second. Let's rejoin our story on the road home to Emmaus with Cleopas and his friend and the stranger that we know is Jesus. Remember, Jesus had been telling them about God's redeeming work all through the scriptures, back starting with Moses. And the time has begun to pass more quickly now as they enter town. And it looks like the stranger plans to keep on walking, to pass through to another place. And the two men ask him to stay. It's out of concern for their new friend, traveling in the evening on a dark road, but also they have enjoyed his company. They want to welcome him into their home to offer him a meal. And that is when it happens. In the simplest of ways, in the sitting at a table, in the breaking of the bread. The stranger the guest. He takes up the bread as if he is the host of the meal. He offers thanks to God. He offers the blessing. And then, bam, it hits them. I mean, their eyes are open. They recognize Jesus. Jesus, as the stranger, has been doing, well, Jesus-y things all along. He's been walking the road with them. He's been talking with them. He's been teaching about God. But maybe this, this is the most Jesus-y thing he could do, to sit at a table and break bread. Now we're hearing this story from Luke's gospel. And Luke puts Jesus at a lot of tables, a lot of dinner parties. And he's usually at those tables with, well, what they might call the wrong people. You know, the sinners, the tax collectors, the prostitutes. And I wonder how many meals have Cleopas and his friend been at with Jesus? How many invitations have they accepted to dine with him? We don't know, but perhaps this was the way they knew him best. And so there, in the fellowship of an evening meal, to nourish them after a long day and a long walk, they couldn't help but recognize him. And then, as soon as it happens, as soon as they see him, he's gone. But the joy and the hope, they have returned. And he may not be right there, but he is there even more so. Their hearts are burning with the good news he gave them along the road about God's saving actions in the world. And now they knew why. Now they could see he had been with them all along the way. And they run back to Jerusalem. Never mind that it is evening. They have to tell the others. And and what a joyful exchange that is. All of them sharing how the Lord is risen indeed. So then, back to that last thing I said before I took us back to the story. What I said was, come on, Jesus, don't make us so work so hard to see you. I hear myself say that, and if I'm honest, I hear Jesus talk back. Come on, Trish, is it really hard work to see me? in plain sight. Point taken. Because how often do I spend time in the word apart from writing a sermon? How often do I welcome the company of a stranger who has something to teach me? How often do I rest in the nourishment that's provided by evening meal and fellowship? I've been giving this some thought about how we might help one another with all this, with this recognizing Jesus in plain sight. Now, I know your eyes and my eyes, well, 
will still be kept from recognizing Jesus on any given day. He'll be there doing his level best to help us feel his love and presence, but there will still be times we miss it completely. But we are not alone walking this road. We are together, and Jesus is with us. So how can we be more intentional about walking together, especially in these times when we have to be apart? And in this story, I keep being drawn back to Jesus opening the scriptures. And so I haven't worked out all the details yet, but, but my plan is that, well, I want to invite you to join me in listening to the weekly scriptures beginning this Wednesday. Just the scriptures. I'm going to read them live on Facebook and we'll post them on YouTube but then I encourage you to listen to one another out loud at home through the week and to talk about with one another what you hear, to listen to it read by different voices, and depending on the day, you will hear things differently. Jesus will be recognized in new words, in new ways. And if you live at home alone, call a friend. Read it together over the phone Listen, share what you heard. We don't have to be at a scholarly level, a a seminary level of Bible study here. We just need to listen. We just need to share what we've heard. We just need to be with Jesus in the word of God. To hear him speak to us to joyfully run to one another and say, the Lord is risen indeed, and tell one another what it is we have heard. Now by run to one another, one another, I mean figuratively, of course. But we're learning that there's so many ways we can do that. So keep watch for more communication on this, especially uh, tune in on Wednesday. But in the meantime, later tonight, tomorrow, Tuesday, revisit these three scriptures from today, Acts, 1 Peter, and Luke. Read out loud, listen, and share. Walk with Jesus in the word. Be gathered in fellowship and share this nourishment that he offers us. The Lord is risen indeed. Amen. Together we join in confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We join together now in the prayers of the people, the response to Lord in your mercy is hear our prayer. Let us pray. Uplifted by the promised hope of healing and resurrection, we join the people of God in all times and places in praying for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Risen Lord, You are present with us even when our eyes cannot recognize you. Help us to help each other see you as we walk this road together. Bring us to your word, open our ears to hear you, nourish our faith, restore our hope and joy, and send us with hearts burning to tell the story of your saving love for the world. 
Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For the diverse natural world, for jungles and prairies, forests, valleys, mountains, for all the wild and endangered animals who call these spaces home, we pray that they are nurtured and protected. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For broken systems we have inherited and that we continue to perpetuate, forgive us. Restrain nations from fighting over limited resources. Redeem us from cycles of scarcity and mistrust and violence. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all who call upon your healing name, give rest. Stay with us. Walk with all those who are hungry, friendless, despairing, and desiring healing in body and spirit. We especially remember all those for whom prayer has been requested on our Gloria Day prayer chain. And all those we name before you now, silently or aloud. Lord, in your mercy. For the faith-forming ministries of this church, help us find creative new ways to grow together in faith and be nourished by your word. Lord, in your mercy. Create in our hearts a yearning to rest in your promise of eternal and resurrected life. Give us thankful hearts for those who have died, even as we look forward to the hope of new life with you. Lord, in your mercy. With bold confidence in your love, Almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your eternal care through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now would be the time we would worship God with our offerings. And I continue to thank you for your faithfulness and your generosity, for the ways that you keep your commitment to supporting God's work through uh, the mission and the work of Gloria Day. Again, we, we don't know what all will unfold in the days ahead, how we'll be called upon to serve and help the world. So thank you that you continue to um, seek to support that ministry and that work. I invite you now to join me then in praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our final hymn, Christ is Alive, Let Christians Sing. We will be singing um, verses 1, 4, and 5. 1, 4, and 5. <laughs>
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God.